Howdy guys. In this video we are going to uh, continue to discuss financial analysis. Um, it, it continues off of part one that's in a prior video. So this is financial analysis part two. The outline for this video is three parts. First we are going to talk about an overview of performance metrics, what they are, why they're important. Talk about categories of metrics. And finally, examples of metrics, particularly those that are important in the industrial distribution industry. An overview of performance metrics. Reviewing just the numbers presented on a financial statement does not always provide a full picture of performance. A review of certain performance metric provides a more thorough analysis. Now to be clear, not all metrics result from financial information. For example, on-time fill rate is a non-financial metric. Um, may certainly lead to financial results, but is not something you would find the information on financial statements to calculate. Some metrics may be key to judging performance. Uh, these metrics that are really important are often referred to as key performance indicators or KPIs. Performance metrics are analyzed on a couple of things. One is we can compare them to benchmarks. A benchmark might be an industry average or an industry best practice or maybe a company average or a company best practice, wherever that benchmark might come from. So for example, um, an industry average for or company average for inventory turns may be six and you analyze your location and you're at seven. So you have a higher inventory turn than the company average. Another thing we might compare metrics to are trends. So just go using the prior example, if your inventory turns are, for example, six, and you're looking and they were, a couple of years ago they were at three, last year they were at four, uh, earlier in the year they were at five, and now you're at six, you know it's trending in the direction of higher inventory turns. So who uses these performance metrics? Uh, performance metrics can be used by creditors to make decisions about uh, lending money to the company, whether to do it or whether to continue to do it. Oftentimes you have certain metrics that, that um, are important and we call it staying within your covenants. Um, the bank might have a, a requirement that you stay within certain covenants and they look at these different metrics making decisions about whether to call your loan or not. Owners make decisions with metrics based on whether to invest or not to invest or how much to invest. Customers and suppliers make decisions uh, with metrics to decide whether to partner with a particular company in the supply chain. And finally, managers uh, use metrics to, to kind of help them determine where to focus their efforts and, and, and how they can improve the company. Categories of performance metrics. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to categorize uh, metrics. Um, I've used several different ones uh, myself. The way we'll do it for this lesson is we're going to categorize them according to the following list. Safety metrics, customer service metrics, liquidity and risk metrics, growth metrics, gross margin metrics, operating expense metrics, also accounts receivable, inventory metrics, accounts payable, cash cycle, profitability metrics, and then we'll leave some room for some other metrics as well. Metrics may fit into one or more categories. So there might be, for example, something that uh, would be an accounts receivable metric, but would also be a cash cycle metric. Some metrics may be internal only, which means that you're not going to be able to go and get publicly uh, public uh, financial disclosures and be able to calculate it. So, for example, some customer service metrics and safety metrics, these things are going to be internal numbers um, that you have to actually work for the company, have access to these internal numbers to be able to calculate. Safety metrics. Safety metrics are important to track so that companies uh, can get a gauge of how well their efforts in the area of safety are working. Um, sometimes those metrics might, might 
start to inch up or get uh, maybe to a level that we're not as comfortable with and it might be time to review our policies, maybe uh, do additional safety training or uh, maybe examine culturally what might be going on. Some of the things that might be tracked by certain companies might be deliveries per accident. Um, obviously, you'd like your accident rate to be zero, um, but if you're a decent sized company with lots of vehicles on the road, accidents will happen, unfortunately. And, and sometimes they're not even our fault, but we're still going to track that. Um, and the reason is, is because if this starts getting low, we would like this number to be high. Um, if the number starts getting low, which means we're making less deliveries per accident, then we, again, might want to examine our policies and procedures and potential training to do. Some other things that might be tracked is OSHA recordable incident rate. Um, OSHA recordable rate is anything uh, beyond standard first aid. And so if, if someone gets hurt and they have to go to the doctor and get stitches, that would be an example of an OSHA recordable incident. And we would track that. There's also OSHA loss time rate, um, which tracks how often someone gets hurt to the point that they can't work. And then OSHA restricted or transfer rate, which means that uh, we've reassigned them to different duties because they can no longer, due to an injury, no longer do uh, what their standard uh, duties are. For example, if someone loads trucks and they get hurt, hurt their back, something happens, and they can, and the doctor says, hey, they can no longer load trucks until they heal from this. During that period of time, uh, we would prefer to reassign that individual to a different type of job that they could help us with um, rather than have them uh, lose time. And there's a couple of reasons why we would do that. One of the main ones is to help get the, the, the employee involved in the company, involved in the culture, and continuing to be productive um, for obviously the company's interest, but also for the employee's best interest. Safety metrics are typically internal metrics. This is not, again, when we talk about internal, this is not something you're going to be able to look at a set of financials and be able to determine um, how the company's performing from a safety standpoint. So this will typically be something that managers internally are tracking within the company. Customer service metrics. Obviously, customer service is important in a lot of industries, particularly important in the distribution industry. Uh, some of the metrics we might track are on-time delivery percentage, number of complaints. So we're getting uh, more complaints, less complaints than typical. Back order percentage. How often do we not have the product and we're having to back order it? And obviously, that has cost because uh, not only do we have to basically let the customer know that we don't have it, but we're going to have to make a second delivery when we get the product in to deliver it. Along that line, fill rate, and that takes into a lot of uh, things. Obviously, if we don't have it and we can't fill that order um, and we may have made a mistake or something like that, um, there's certain companies out there, they have this on-time complete and accurate that they track uh, just to see that they're meeting their customers' expectations from that standpoint. You also have things like net promoter score um, that some companies track. And again, a lot of these are more internal. This is something that we're tracking internally. I know there's some companies that have, um, and I've even been part of companies that that advertise their customer service metrics. So they track those and they, they advertise this is our performance. Um, personally, I've found that the only thing customers typically care about is how well you're doing with their stuff. So if you say we're 95% on time complete and accurate, but you seem to be messing up a lot with that customer, the customer is not really going to care what your overall statistics are. Okay. But just because customers don't care about the number and don't want it doesn't mean we don't need to track it. We track it because it helps us to determine if we're heading in the right direction and what we need to do to perform better. Liquidity and risk metrics um, include things such as working capital, which is defined as your current assets minus your current liabilities. And similar to that one, and we'll talk about them together, is the current ratio, which is your current assets divided by your current liabilities. If you remember from an earlier video, current assets are all assets that are expected to be converted into cash within a given period. Typically, we're talking about a year. <clears throat> Current liabilities are 
liabilities that are expected to consume cash within a year. So if we're analyzing our company, we look at this and we say if current assets are lower than current liabilities, then we may have a cash problem within a, within a year because we have less things being converted into cash and more things consuming cash. So typically on your current ratio, you want that to be greater than one. On your working capital, you want that to be greater than zero. Um, typically from a current ratio standpoint, you're looking at, you know, ideally you're anywhere from one and a half to two and a half. Now, there is something to be said about the proper use of current liabilities to generate returns, basically using other people's money or whatever it may be. We'll talk more about that in another video. Here we're talking, or later in this video, here we're talking more about analyzing risk. And if I look at a company and their current liabilities are higher than their current assets, um, as measured by working capital current ratio, that could be a red flag that there could be some problems coming down. Another similar ratio is the quick ratio. This is similar to the current ratio um, in that it's cash plus cash equivalents plus accounts receivable divided by current liability. So the denominator is the same as in current ratio, but the numerator is different. The main difference here is that we're ignoring inventory because we realize that inventory takes a little bit longer to convert into cash. And so we're analyzing things that can be converted into cash quicker. The last metric we'll discuss um, in this category is financial leverage. And you calculate that by total assets divided by total equity. Um, so you might think about it if you bought a house that cost $200,000 and you put $40,000 down on the house. In essence, you have a $200,000 house or asset utilizing only your forty thousand dollars of equity so in that case your financial leverage would be five to one or five in real estate that type of uh, leverage is is probably acceptable and common uh, common to put twenty percent down on an asset in distribution we might see that as being a little bit high um, in, in most distribution industries uh, you would probably be looking for a little bit lower financial leverage, more in the 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 two and a half to three and a half range, probably. Growth metrics. Growth is an extremely important um, concept when it comes to distribution. Um, there's a famous line from a movie that says, "You're either growing or you're dying." There ain't no third direction. But the reality of it is is that if you're if you're not growing some of the other metrics can be hard to manage and so people want to am, analyze your growth you know that can be based on your ability to capture market share or just that your market in general is growing and you're growing with it two of the more important uh, metrics and growth metrics one is revenue growth uh, current year revenue minus previous year revenue divided by previous year revenue would give us our revenue growth percentage Similarly is EBIT growth. If you remember EBIT, uh, earnings before interest and taxes is the same as our operating profit growth. So operating profit growth percentage is your current year EBIT minus your previous year EBIT divided by your previous year EBIT. Um, if you ask someone which of these two is more important, I will tell you personally, I would, I would, if I had to choose one, I'd rather my profit be growing than my revenue growing and my profit not growing. I'd rather uh, not be doing more work uh, for the same amount of profit. However, there's something to be said for revenue growth as well um, because typically there's not an accounting um, decisions made of what constitutes uh, top line growth such as revenue growth as opposed to operating profit. Sometimes there's more uh, decisions that can impact that from period to period where revenue growth really kind of shows how much money your customers are spending with you. So in the end, they're both important. Another growth metric to consider is unit growth percent. Um, this will be current year units minus previous year units divided by previous year units. Um, here, the, what we're trying to track is that if we just track revenue growth, that can be highly impacted by inflationary pricing. So for example, 
um, as we're recording this, we're in an era in the distribution industry where prices are going up on product rapidly. There was a time period, and this is over 15 years ago when I was managing a uh, company, and um, I was selling a product to my best customer in September of one year at 169 a thousand, just how we priced it. The following year, I'm buying it and having to mark it up and sell it for over 500 a thousand. So because that product can change that much in pricing from a revenue growth standpoint, I can look like I'm really growing, but it's just reflected in the inflationary pricing. So uh, certain industries, uh, roofing, for example, they'll track uh, squares of shingles and lumber business. They might track board feet or square footage of products sold and in other industries. They have different things that they track to figure out if you're actually moving more units than previous years. Another way to calculate unit growth, and that will be an internal metric. Um, so that's typically something we would track internally. Another way we could calculate unit growth percentage is if we could back out that inflationary impact um, on the pricing. So for example, if we took the current year revenue, and if we knew, for example, prices were up by 10%, take the current year revenue and divide it by 1.1, which would be one plus that 10%. And then you're basically doing the same thing as the revenue growth percentage. So current year revenue, back out the inflation by dividing it by one plus inflation rate, then minus previous year revenue divided by previous year revenue. This would be something if you had that number or at least had an estimate of it that you could get a rough idea of how much growth the company or the division of the company had that wasn't impacted by changes in price. Gross margin metrics. Gross margin is defined as revenue minus cost of goods sold. Um, it's an extremely important metric in distribution. In fact, it's been argued uh, by some in the accounting community that, that distributors and similar entities shouldn't even recognize revenue because of that revenue number, such a big part of it is what they paid for the product, which is your cost of goods sold. So for example, if I bought something for 70, and I sell it for $30 above that, I'm selling it for 100. My gross margin is that 100 minus the 70 or $30. And again, there's been some people that argue that that really is your top line. Um, I would disagree with that, but I do recognize how important that number is and why they're making that argument. Um, so gross margin is gonna be one of the most important things that we calculate in distribution. We compare it to benchmarks, compare it to trends, whatever it may be. And, there's, and we use that gross margin number in a lot of other metrics as well. Also, what you need to know is gross margin percentage. Gross margin percentage is revenue minus our cost of goods sold divided by revenue. Um, you may have learned in, in, in other classes or previous videos um, that if, you're, if you divided that instead by re of revenue, you divided it by cost of goods sold, you would actually be having a markup percentage. But here what we want to discuss is how important the gross margin percentage is. Um, big metric track, uh, if your gross margin percentage is going down and you're not able to control your cost, you could end up in a situation um, where you're making a lot less money than you thought um, by the end of the year. Operating expense metrics. Uh, operating expenses are often referred to as OPEX for short. So we'll utilize that language here as well. One of the metrics is OPEX percent of sales. So how much of your revenue is being consumed by operating expenses? So here you just take operating expenses divided by revenue. Again, in distribution with gross margin being important, we would also do the same thing as a percentage of gross margin. What percentage? OPEX as a percentage of gross margin is your operating expenses divided by your gross margin. In S, it's what percentage of your gross margin is being consumed by operating expenses? Something else um, that we like to track, it's pretty important in, in a lot of industries, particularly distribution, is what we refer to as the personnel productivity ratio, or PPR. Here we'll take our total employee cost and divide that by gross margin dollars. So your total employee cost considers everything what you pay your people in the form of salary commission bonus whatever 
um, but also what you pay in, in other benefits, other employee related costs. So it's your total employee cost divided by your gross margin dollars. And again, this is going to tell you what percentage of your gross margin dollars is being consumed by people related expenses. Another way to look at this is the inverse of that, and what I refer to as the personnel productivity multiplier or PPM. Here we just take our gross margin dollars and divide it by total employee cost. I'm a bigger fan of the PPM uh, than, the, than the PPR just simply for the fact that it really tells me what I'm trying to do there. So basically for every dollar I spend on employee related expenses, how much gross margin dollars do we generate in our business? And so we always want to try to be making our employees more productive and uh, be able to generate higher gross margin dollars because of it. Typically these last two are going to be more internal. Again, that just means um, you're not going to pull out a set of financials usually of a publicly traded company and find out what their employee related costs are. They're not required to provide that level of detail and uh, so they typically do not. Accounts receivable metrics. Uh, again, as a reminder, accounts receivable is the, the money our customers owe us for product or services that we've sold to them. Um, it's typically one of either the largest or second largest asset on most distributors books. So we typically have a lot of capital tied up in, in accounts receivable and want to make sure we're managing it correctly. One of the metrics that we look at is day sales outstanding or DSO. Here we're going to take our annual revenue, which is how much we sell in a year, and divide it by 365. And that's going to tell us how much we sell every day. And we're going to divide that into our accounts receivable. So accounts receivable divided by that number. Here we're making an assumption that everything we sell is on uh, is, is utilizing accounts receivable. Some people may separate this because they have a lot of cash business, so they may uh, ignore in their annual revenue, ignore um, any type of sales that, have, that are cash and don't, don't go through accounts receivable. But here we're kind of making the assumption that, it, that everything goes through accounts receivable. So we do this, accounts receivable divided by that average daily sales number. What that's going to do is it's going to tell you on average or currently how long does it take you to collect your money from the time you sell an item so you sell it let's say you do this DSO and it's 35 days on average it's taking you 35 days to collect your money either and when you do this you can either do it as annual number or I'm sorry you can do it as uh, average accounts receivable for the year or you can calculate it as current accounts receivable. So if you're calculating what your average DSO was for the year, again, you would take the average accounts receivable. But if you want to know um, what your current accounts receivable, or current, I'm sorry, current day sales outstanding is, you would look at your current accounts receivable number. Another metric we would track is our gross margin return on accounts receivable. Take your total gross margin dollars for the year and divide this by your average accounts receivable for the year. Um, so where would we get the average? Typically we could, we could, if we had monthly numbers, we could add them all up and divide by 12. Um, if we had quarterly numbers, add them all up and divide by four. Or if we just maybe had the beginning of the year and the end of the year, add them up and divide by two. It may not be the best way to get an average, but it may be all we have if we're looking at published financials. So again, Gross margin return on accounts receivable is total gross margin divided by that average accounts receivable. And what this number is going to tell you is how well you're utilizing your accounts receivable to generate gross margin dollars. Inventory metrics. Um, first metric we'll discuss is one of the most common metrics in distribution, and that's inventory turnover. Here we'll take our total cost of goods sold for the year and divide that by our average inventory. A common number is somewhere between four and seven. Uh, for example, that, that you're turning your inventory that many times per year. Inventory turnover is an extremely important metric. Um, inventory is one of those things in distribution that it's typically your first or second largest asset on the books along with accounts receivable. So you got a lot of capital tied up in 
inventory. Um, on t but in addition to that, in addition to how much capital you have tied up, so it's an extremely important financial metric, it's also a very important customer service metric because customers and suppliers alike expect the distributor to be very good at managing inventory. And typically that's one of the strongest suits of most high performing distributors is how good they are at managing their inventory. So this is going to be an important metric. I will tell you though, and it's my opinion that it's one of the most abused metrics um, because people take it um, and, and with such an effort to try to improve this, they'll make decisions. So for example, they might say, and if an inventory item doesn't turn four times a year, you can't stock it. And that may or may not be the right decision, um, but I think basing it strictly on inventory turnover is not the right decision. There's other metrics that we can use as well. Another metric to look at is our days of inventory or a DOI. This is similar to day sales outstanding. Here we're going to take our, our inventory figure and divide that by how much we sell from a cost of goods sold standpoint every day. So take your annual cost of goods sold or yearly cost of goods sold, divide that by 365. It'll give you how much you sell on average every day and then divide that into your inventory. And what that's going to tell you is on average from the time you receive an item until the time you sell it. So basically on average how long it sits in your warehouse. And again, similar to day sales outstanding, we can use the um, average inventory if we want to know our average DOI or we can use current inventory to figure out what our current DOI is. Another really important metric in distribution that really should be utilized along with the inventory uh, turn metric is the gross margin return on inventory investment. Here we're going to take our total gross margin dollars for the year, for example, and divide that by average inventory. When we do that, we're going to get a, a number, and usually it's expressed in a percentage. So if you if you if you did it and it came to a two, you would express it as 200%. Similar to you would also do that with gross, gross margin and return on accounts receivable. Um, but either way is fine. You can express it as two, or you can express it as 200%. Um, but our total gross margin dollars divided by our average inventory. In essence, what this is telling us is how well we're utilizing our inventory to generate gross margin dollars. One of the things I prefer about gross margin return on inventory investment as opposed to um, inventory turns by themselves is all the different ways that you can improve this metric. So for example, if you calculate it uh, for a particular item and your GIMROI is not where you want that number to be, there's a couple of different things that you can do. So let's look again. Remember that total gross margin is basically your total revenue minus your cost of goods sold. And we're basically dividing that by average inventory to get what we refer to as a GIMROI. So, Again, we look at it and we have a particular inventory item or maybe a particular uh, group of inventory items uh, that aren't meeting our minimum standards or our goals or what we're trying to achieve um, and why we're measuring these metrics in the first place. So what are the things we can do? Well, one of the things we can go back to the customer, maybe you don't necessarily have this conversation, but you could just basically, if your customers value the amount of inventory that you're stocking for this particular item, then that may need to translate into a higher price. And so if we raise our price, that's going to improve the GIMROI. Now, the customer may not care the, about how much inventory you have in stock. For, they typically do, but there may be situations where, you know, they give you a month, two month notice or whatever it may be. So they really don't value you stocking the item. That still doesn't mean you shouldn't stock it because the supplier may value you stocking it. Suppliers value having their inventory in the local markets. So in this particular case, we may have to negotiate a lower cost to get sold to what we're paying for that particular item. But if the customer doesn't value the stocking level that we have, the supplier doesn't value the stocking level we have, then it may be time to lower our inventory. Okay, remember that accounts payable is the money we owe our suppliers for products we've purchased from them. In essence, this is where the supplier is helping finance our business. 
is by giving us payment terms, whether that term, those terms are 10 days, 30 days, maybe in some instances we can negotiate really long payment terms, 180 plus maybe. Um, I've given us that much time to pay for it. And so this is a good thing. This is utilizing the supplier's money to help finance our organization. And typically we get those extended payment terms such as that when we are a good customer and we're helping them achieve their goals. One of the metrics we'll look at is our days payable outstanding or DPO. Here we'll take our accounts payable and divide it uh, again by how much product we're moving every day, which is annual cost to get sold divided by 365. That'll give us on average how much we're moving every day. Divide that into our accounts payable and that gives us our days payable outstanding. In essence, what this is telling you is from the day you receive an item until the day you pay for that item, how many days is that? Um, and again, we can use average accounts payable if we want to know what the average DPO is, or we can use a current accounts payable to figure out what the current DPO is. Another metric um, for accounts payable metrics is uh, accounts payable as a percentage of inventory. Here we just take our average accounts payable and divide it by our average inventory. This will tell you what percentage of your inventory is being financed by your suppliers. Cash cycle metrics. You always heard cash is king. Cash is extremely important. At the end of the day, we don't keep the doors open uh, because of percentages. We keep the door open because of how much cash we generate to pay our rent or other expenses. Three metrics we'll look at that we've already talked about is our days of inventory, our days sales outstanding, and our days payable outstanding. We'll combine these into a metric we call the cash conversion cycle. And here we take our days of inventory plus our day sales outstanding minus our days payable outstanding. And so in essence, what this is gonna tell you is your cash to cash period. So from what time, from the, the time between when you pay for an item and then when you ultimately collect from the customer. That's your cash conversion cycle. And again, we can use current numbers or we can use average numbers depending on what we're trying to accomplish. And we'll look at a, a, a graphical representation on this of this on the next slide. So, from the time we receive an item until the time we sell it is our days of inventory. From the time we sell it till the time we collect it is our day sales outstanding. Backing up from when we receive it to when we actually pay for the item is our days payable outstanding. So days of inventory plus days out sales outstanding minus days payable outstanding is our cash conversion cycle. So for example, if days of inventory is 60 days, day sales outstanding is 45 days, days payable outstanding is 30 days, our cash conversion cycle would be 75 days. So it takes 75 days from the time we pay for an item until we actually collect. This is the amount of time or the, the length of time that we're financing our working capital. Profitability metrics. I guess it could be argued that all metrics have some impact on profitability, but these typically are, are referred to more as profitability metrics. So one example is asset turnover. This is total revenue divided by your average of total assets. This basically helps you look at your assets and examine how well you're utilizing your assets to generate revenue. Operating income percentage. Take your operating profit or remember your EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes, and divide that by total revenue. So what percentage of your revenue becomes operating income or operating profit. And another number is your EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Uh, the way we would calculate that is you'd have your net profit before tax, add back in your interest, and add back in your depreciation and amortization. We'll talk more about this for sure when we get to valuation because this number will become critical when we talk about valuing operating in companies such as distributors. Some additional profitability metrics that are really important. One is return on total assets. 
Internal total assets will take operating profit. Again, remember it's EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. And divide that by our average of our total assets. It's basically telling us how well we're utilizing our assets to generate operating profit. Another important number is return on capital employed. Sometimes you'll hear this as return on net assets. You might also hear it as return on invested capital. But return on capital employed is probably the best description. So here we're going to take our operating profit and divide it by the average of total assets minus current liabilities. Again, don't get caught up in the average, but pay attention to what's in parentheses. Total assets minus current liabilities. Why would that number be important? Well, typically in a distributor, our largest current liability is accounts payable. Other things in there are things that we owe money for, but we haven't paid yet. This is typically natural occurrences within the distribution business um, that create these liabilities. But in essence, like with accounts payable, we have the inventory, but we haven't paid for it yet. So that's a good thing. It's, it's, we want to minus that out and look at it. Another way to look at this is that we're looking at capital employed. So we're looking at all the capital that has to be employed by either our creditors or our investors. And so our creditors and our investors aren't funding our accounts payable, our suppliers are. But they're funding everything else other than current liabilities. So this is an extremely important number to track. And then obviously a really important one to investors is return on equity, which is basically your net income. So now we're not talking about operating profit. We're talking about net income divided by total assets minus total liabilities, which again, if you remember that would, you know, since total assets equals total liabilities plus shareholders equity, in essence, you're dividing net income by average equity. There's a lot of other metrics out there that can be tracked. Um, typically, some of the things I see in distribution that are more internal metrics that would get tracked might be revenue or operating profit per full-time equivalent. So basically, if you have full-time employee, that's one FTE. If they are part-time, you might typically, they just count it as half a full-time equivalent. So how much revenue are we generating basically per person? Another one might be line item or square feet um, of product actually moved per warehouse employee. That'll tell us how productive we're being. And it can also, when we have these types of metrics, then we can start examining as we grow how many more warehouse employees we may need or how many more people in general. Also, we might look at revenue or gross profit per truck. Um, and again, that way when we're budgeting, we can know, okay, if the branch expects to be able to grow from 10 million to 15 million, how many more trucks will they potentially need to accomplish that? Another metric I've seen that's an important metric is percentage of strategic vendor purchases. Um, some people may be percentage of, of, of A and B vendors if they rank their vendors or percentage coming from our top tier vendors or whatever it may be, a lot of different terms that this can go by. Um, basically, an example of this would be take your, your purchases from your strategic vendors and divide that by your total purchases to come up with that percentage. Now, in a lot of places, uh, a lot of different industries, this might just be dictated to, buy, to the local branches or to um, or to the division manager or whoever it may be saying you have to buy from these certain vendors and while we may have that in distribution somewhat we also give our people in the field a lot of uh, a lot of leeway to make those decisions because as a company while you know manufacturer XYZ may be very good to us as a company in the entire United States as a whole in College Station, Texas, they may be underperforming. And if we're relying on them, we might not be able to be successful in College Station, Texas. So we give our people in the field a lot of leeway to make those decisions. But overall, we would hope that at least a large percentage of their purchases were coming from what we would consider to be uh, strategic vendors. And that concludes our video on financial analysis part two.